All glory to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's the author and finisher of our faith, and without him, nothing is possible. Welcome again to Faiths and Gates. I will be talking about the four pillars of salvation and why, again, once saved, all, always saved is a false doctrine from the pits of hell. And anyone who believes in that is subjecting themselves to falling in a comfortable lifestyle of sin, potentially without even knowing it. Okay, we're creatures of habit. And during our everyday endeavors and all the things that we do, it's human nature to always look for shortcuts. And that is no different in our walk with Christ. A lot of Christians in these end times have become lazy and they've put everything on Christ to account for their laziness. Okay, so we're going to get right into it, and I don't mean to demean anyone, but I just felt led by the Lord to, again, go into this and go into it in depth. We're going to start from Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. Now, the, these scriptures is what hit me the hardest when I first came to the Lord, because one of the first questions I started to say in my heart is, why is the gate so narrow? Why is it that an overwhelming majority of people are going to the lake of fire when they die? And according to statistics, there are at least 2 billion people throughout the world who's confessed Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, even if it was a million or 500,000. The numbers and the ratio, it doesn't amount to what Christ confessed in verse 13 and 14 of Matthew chapter 7. Few versus many is not even 300,000 out of 7 billion. Okay, so let's read it line for line, word for word. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. It says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Okay, so there are few who will enter into the kingdom of God, and there are many who are on the broad road going to hell. Now, amongst those many, there, uh, of course, there are people who are atheistic and who don't believe there's any God at all, and they never confess Jesus as their, their Lord and Savior. There are people who just live a life of worldliness. They can care less about Christ. They don't claim to be atheists. You know, every now and then they may do the church thing and, you know, go and mention the name of Jesus but there, there's also scripture, I don't have time to go there, it talks about having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Okay, now I personally believe that people who believe in one saved, always saved, are semi-atheists. And what I mean by that is you claim that you know Christ Yet, we strive to live to be like Christ. So when we become new creatures, we supposed to want to repent because Christ, we're claiming that Christ has come to live in us. Now, we're not putting it on works that because we repent, because we fast, because we love our neighbor, that we are deserving of eternal life. That's not what we're saying. We're still putting it on Christ. Christ did the work. Therefore, because we repent, repent, it's his blood that washes our sins away. It's his grace that is being applied to the words that we speak out of our mouth through repentance. So it's not by our own merit. It is, it is Christ who works in us. 
But because we've put shifted everything onto him, now the power is in his hands now to tell us what he demands of us. Okay? And in, in, in the days of his flesh, the, uh, uh, when John the Baptist introduced Christ, one of the first things he said was repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Okay? Now, I repent. Because I have faith in Christ who has the power to forgive sins. I fast to show him the sincerity of my repentance. And because he sees my faith that makes him give me grace. Okay? My faith is what makes him give me grace because without faith, it's impossible to please God. You see? So in that cycle... You've got repentance, you've got faith, you got works, and you've got grace. The thief on the cross, God, it, God saw his faith, okay, and he gave him grace. The paralytic, God saw his faith and then gave him grace and said, your sins are forgiven you, okay? We didn't see anything about him uh, fasting or doing anything like that. Of course, there are situations people are on their deathbed. They don't have any time to go out and do works and fast and minister to people. That's just God's grace. That's a gift from God. We're not saying that, but th that people absolutely have to do works to be saved and works alone save you. No, when you're living a lifestyle, the Apostle Paul talked about those who practice. Practice is the lifestyle that you live. Okay, Jesus cast those people into outer darkness because he said you practice lawlessness. Okay, the opposite of lawlessness is righteousness. Okay, but when we're talking about lifestyle, there are scriptures that say we go from faith to faith and glory to glory. Okay, your, your trials are more precious than gold when, trial, when tried by fire. That's, that sounds like those who believe Christ, because they believe Christ, they are willing to endure through those child, trials that are tried by fire. Uh, another scripture is many are the afflictions of the righteous. Okay? Christ in the days of his flesh talked about those who practiced lawlessness. They were unwilling to sacrifice for the Christ that they claimed to have faith in. Okay? That's why when Peter denied Christ, that was such a big deal. And then Christ had to come back to cancel out the curse that would have come upon, uh, upon Peter for denying him three times. That's why Christ Christ said, do you love me? And he repeated that three times so that the law of love can cancel out Peter's lawlessness for lying. The scripture says a liar will not tarry in my sight. So Peter, the, all that time was on the hook for that, that lie that he told when he denied Christ three times. All right. The Apostle Paul warned about the 17 works of the flesh and those who practice such things. He didn't say those who confess Jesus as their Lord and Savior, uh, that they believe in their heart, that they're exempt from being punished for practicing the 17 works of the flesh. No, it's those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And that's why we have to thank God for his grace because there are times where we may not have been truthful for some things. But God forbid if a person passes away without correcting that error that they spoke out of their mouth, which was a lie or a cuss word or whatever the case may be. That's why we thank God for his grace. He does say he'll have mercy on whom he please. Okay, but it takes faith, grace, works, and repentance to avoid lawlessness, 
again, I'm speaking strictly from the standpoint of what you practice. The uh, Hebrews 4 verse 12 says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So, so God is able to, inju- to judge the intents of a person's heart if they're, they're willing to live a lifestyle of practicing righteousness, uh, uh, practicing avoiding deceiving people, practicing avoiding being greedy and being selfish in the heart, bitterness of the heart. Those are all heart issues. Just because you confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that doesn't mean that your heart has been healed from your previous lifestyle. That's that's why Apostle Paul said, I die daily, okay? That's why he also said we're to put off the old man and to put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of of him who created him. All right? When you go to Romans 12, verse 1 and 2, it says, Present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Holiness without no man shall see the Lord. It says, And do, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Okay, we're to present our bodies a living sacrifice. And that is our reasonable service. Salvation is not free. There there are things that you have to do to show that you love God. Okay? Okay. The scripture commands us to love the Lord with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our strength. Colossians 2 verse 17 says the law is a shadow of the good things to come. We go down to Colossians 3 verse 16. It says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Okay, Joshua 1 verse 8. Meditate on the word day and night. First Thessalonians 5 verse 17, pray without season. Paul said in Romans 7 verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And this is the Apostle Paul speaking, because he was aware that this is a fallen world that we live in. Jeremiah 17, 9 says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Okay, Paul said again in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified, become a castaway. These are all works that we're talking about here. Okay, oftentimes you may have put in the work, but need God to put his super on your natural to break through, to break strongholds. That's grace. But a lot of the a lot of theologians have taught generations to be skilled in their opening arguments and rebuttals versus yielding to the spirit which reveals all things to man that you you would you would not need for man to teach you okay some of you who believe in this once saved always saved doctrine will hear this message and instead of listening to the spirit of god speak through me you will start immediately trying to form your rebuttals and your opening arguments and that that's where that spirit of pride comes from You may need deliverance from that spirit, okay? Because the the Bible calls them seducing spirits. These men have gone out to teach things that are not of the covenant 
not of the new covenant, the new test of men. That's what testament means. There was an old test of men. Okay, there's a new test of men, a new test that men must face. Yes, we're under the law of grace, but the law of grace uh, comes with some disclaimers. Okay, and you have to read the scripture. That's why this book is as thick as it is. All right, we don't take one scripture and just take, you know, nothing shall, uh, uh, no one shall be able to pluck us out of his hand and just run away with that as if that's the meat and potatoes of the whole new covenant. But why, why was the apostle Paul so hard on Peter when Peter was, was being a hypocrite when it came to the Hebrews and sitting with the Hebrews because he was again going back under the law. Okay. Well, why, why are we to, study to show ourselves approved. Okay, why did the, they even establish apostles? All of these all of these structures and systems, why is it that a woman is not to teach? Okay, that she, yeah, she may have received Christ, but it, again, why do we fight against spirits? Why do we have to fight the good fight of faith? There is no way that you can wiggle out and just try to, but they take those who believe in once saved, always saved, they take those scriptures and start twisting them. It's like squeezing an orange to get the last juice of that orange into the glass. But you don't even get 3% of the glass filled up because that's as far as you're going to get with those scriptures. You have to take those scriptures in context with the rest of the scriptures in the new covenant. Especially in, in the, the, the epistles of the apostles. The bottom line is people who believe in once saved, always saved. They don't believe Christ is powerful enough to dwell in them and keep them from sinning. That's the main issue. They, they, they still struggle. And this is why I say they're semi-atheists. Because they don't believe that a holy God will cast someone to hell for their sins even after they've accepted Christ. That's really what it boils down to. Part of it is laziness as well. Again, as I mentioned earlier, it's human nature and the nature of this flesh to always want a shortcut, okay? Now, for the sake of dismissing and continuing to denote all of the arguments of once saved, always saved. And I'm doing this so that people will hear this message and get right with God. Okay, my flesh doesn't always want to do, you know, I'm just a mortal man. And I have to fight this flesh like any other normal man. I I just want the truth, okay? that As I've said in previous teachings, your three greatest enemies is this world system Okay, the, the, the scriptures warn us to come out from among them and be ye separate. He who loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Okay, that doesn't say uh, he who has confessed me, although he loves the world, I will receive him. There is no scripture in the word that says that. There's so many warnings against returning back to the ways of the flesh, okay? Romans uh, chapter 8 says the carnal mind is enmity against God. It's not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be, okay? So if you live according to the flesh, you're not yielding to the spirit and continuing in the ways of Christ, okay? But let's go to Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. It says, verse 3, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. Okay, falling away from what? Falling away from the good standing in Christ that you once held. Okay, that's what that's saying. There's no wiggle room out of that. 
And continuing on, verse 2, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Okay, the scripture tells us that Satan has come down like a lion seeking whom he may devour. Okay, it doesn't say what sinners he may devour, the, but the Christians are in the, in the ark of safety. It doesn't even reference back to no one can pluck you out of my hand when it's talking about Satan seeking whom he may devour. That's why Peter said, be sober minded. Before that verse, he says, be sober minded. Okay, let's go to Revelation 2 verse 5. Again, Revelation 2 verse 5. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Again, where have they fallen? Where, where have they fallen from? What are the first works versus their recent works where, where, where Christ commands them to repent? Repent means to turn away, turn away from sin. Okay, we live in a fallen meat suit. This earth suit is of this fallen world. Okay, it it's becomes an expiration date. This meat suit has an expiration date and eventually becomes worm food. All right, the flesh is amongst your three greatest enemies. The world, the flesh, and the devil are your three greatest enemies. That's why Paul said, who will deliver me from this body of death? It's only when this corruption puts on incorruption and this mortality puts on immortality. Until God gives you a new body, it, it, Considering if you receive Christ and don't die in your sins, that you receive a new body, then you have nothing to worry about being plucked out of his hands. Meaning, until then, this flesh is very capable of not someone else coming to pluck you out of his hand. No principality, no power, no other person. But this flesh, God still gives you free will. That's why the scripture says we're, we're just pilgrims passing through. Okay, we were somewhere before we came here. All right. The flesh, the, the spirit, the, the, the flesh is like your clone. It's like an evil clone. I don't have time to go, go into that. I'm just going to go to uh, Second Peter I'll have to do that on a whole separate teaching because that's deep, deep talk. Okay, this is, see, it's, you can't remain a two-dimensional thinker. Like when we get into talking about God, is he three persons? And a lot of theologians get into conversations about that. Is he three persons? Are we, when we get to heaven, are we going to see one person or are we going to see three, three persons? Like this is talk of idiocy. I, I'm, Lord, forgive me for saying that, but this is talk of two-dimensional thinkers. Okay, heaven is a whole nother dimension. <laughs> so you don't, your vision won't be the same. I, I don't have time to go into that. But let's go to Second Peter chapter 2, verse 21. Okay, it says, For it would have been, Better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. Okay, again, those who know the way of righteousness are those who have believed. They've had faith. They've confessed and believed Christ and received him in their heart. Okay, and they've gone through the process also of sanctification and justification, and they've continued in the faith. But Peter is saying now they've turned away from the holy commandment that was delivered to them. He's saying that it will be better for those who never knew God than for those who turned away from God. 
All right, so he's saying the center is better than a backslider. Again, that word backslide is to turn away. Okay, so when we're talking about the narrow gate, the narrow way, now we get some context as to why the gate is so narrow and why many go into the broad gate and why few, be it that fine, the narrow gate. And a lot of a lot of this has to do with bitterness of the heart and, you know, a lot of things that we do in our daily lives that we're not cognizant of and putting other things before Christ. I believe many people on that day will be shocked when Christ tell them, listen, you didn't put me first and the things that they considered. As small things, he didn't wink at that. Okay? Many will be shocked. Revelation 3, chapter 3, verse 19 says, Be zealous and repent. Again, I told a guy who I commented on his channel. He actually commented on my channel. But due to screw tube messing with my comments, I had to go to his channel and reply to him. But I told him, I said, listen, it's a difference between being a student and being a disciple. It's good to be both. Acts chapter 3 verse 19 says, repent and be converted so your sins may be blotted out. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10 tells us that godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. Okay, repentance is to turn back and do your first works. All right, now, once you have done that, now that leads to salvation. And that's why I set up my channel and on my website, I have salvation gate, I have deliverance gate, and I have revelation gate. I believe all three are important. All three of them are intertwined with one another according to those who believe in Christ and are of the faith. You're going to get the revelation of Jesus Christ that he is the son of God, that he He died on the cross for our sins and was buried and was resurrected after three days. God raised him from the dead. There is revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay, there is revelation on a lot of the mysteries of God, in particular relating to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I have many videos where I go through through those mysteries. Okay, why is Lucifer on Lake Row? That's that's a deep teaching that you guys should go and check out. All right, but when it comes to salvation. There's, that's, a, that's that narrow gate. Again, there are many gates we go through in learning about God. But the salvation gate, a person may not get all the revelation there is to know about the mysteries of God on their deathbed. You don't have time for that. Okay? But that person at least will know. You must believe in Jesus Christ. You must repent of your sins in order to be saved. And the grace of God is activated when he sees you living a lifestyle of repentance and denying yourself. It, re it protects and gives you insurance on the, when it comes time for you to draw your last breath. If there's anything that you did in between that, that time, of you dropping this meat suit and going to meet your maker, that's where God's grace comes in and the blood of Jesus washes us of our sins. The scripture tells us that he's rich in mercy. Okay, he's rich in abundance of mercy. But that, again, as 2 Corinthians say, that, that godly sorrow, chapter 7, verse 10 of 2 Corinthians, that godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. Godly sorrow is mourning, mourning through fasting. And, and that's why Christ told the disciples, don't be like the Pharisees who put on sackcloth 
and the open public in the marketplaces so that they may be seen and so they may people may view them as being righteous okay uh, Joel chapter 2 12 and 13 says turn to God with all your heart with fasting weeping and mourning okay Luke chapter 5 verse 32 Christ said I have not called the righteous but sinners to repentance okay again going back to the paralytic the guy who was paralyzed, Christ, he didn't even say a word. He didn't repent or anything. Christ just looked at him and saw his faith. The scripture says he saw his faith. And that's when Christ said, your sins are forgiven you. And Christ had to let the Pharisees know that the son of man has the power to forgive sins. The same way that he forgave the thief on the cross. But we're not to take the example of the thief on the cross. And again, like, like, like Paul said, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Absolutely not. Okay, because then that's abusing God's grace. All right. The, uh, we know that according to Hebrews 11 verse 6, that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Hebrews 11 1 says, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 12 verse 2 describes Jesus as the author and finisher of our faith. 2 Corinthians 5 7, we walk by faith and not by sight. Romans 10, 17, faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Galatians 2, verse 16, we're justified by faith in Jesus Christ, not by the works of the law. So those who are Hebrew Israelites and they claim to be keeping all those laws, you can't keep all of those laws. That's where your works fall short. Scripture says, for all have sinned and fallen short the glory of God. Okay, the, the laws of the Old Testament, I don't even know if it's possible for conditions to be met. To the, I mean, the way things have gone with farming, I mean, you have to keep in mind that the men in the Old Testament, so almost all of them had farms or they all were subject to, to the owner of the land, like Jacob was to uh, Laban, where they lived on the farm and tended sheep, and they were allowed to have an account of a certain amount of animals where they would have access to those animals to make those sacrifices. We live in a Babylonian kingdom now. People don't run farms like that. Even the so-called dominant society. The farms have been taken over by corporations. You don't even have access to the, uh, the material to make sacrifices for your sins according to the Old Testament. A lot of these guys are just faking the fun, okay? There are scriptures talking about how a woman, when she's on her impurity, she must go away from, uh, from the camp. And the, those laws were tailor-made for the Israelites during those times anyway because they actually had a land that God was moving them in on. God was raining manna from, from heaven. Uh, you know, a lot of things was provided directly from the Most High because he hadn't taken his hand off of the nations during that time. You see? So... The, the, there, the land was plentiful to where they were able to make those sacrifices for their sins. But Christ, we have the law of grace where Christ was the perfect sacrifice. He lived the perfect life free of sin. Okay, and he died on the cross for our sins. Therefore, he's the lamb that was slain. Okay, the scripture says it pleased him to bruise him. See, the ways of God is different from man. 
when you when you, like I I did a video uh Gematria won't save you. The beginning of that, that video, I played a clip. The guy was talking about how, you know, he doesn't believe in Jesus because he doesn't believe in the sacrifice, sacrificing your son on the cross. See, the carnal mind don't understand the mysteries and the ways of God. Okay, even a righteous man will look back at that scripture and say, okay, God is from a carnal mind. It, it seems that it makes God look bloodthirsty to say that it pleased him to bruise him. But man, man doesn't understand the true nature of that scripture that without faith, it's impossible to please him. Okay. Uh, the scripture says his mercies are new every morning. Uh, Lamentations 3.23. So yes, he has mercy. He has mercy for even the unbelief that man still may have in his heart. That's why we thank him for his grace that he gives us scriptures uh, uh, to fall back on that if you have faith as a, must, as a mustard seed, you can move mountains. Okay? But we can't forget the works part. We're not talking about the works of the law. We already established that you can't keep all of those laws. It's impossible. It's not even tangible. The situation is not even uh, available to man to have the tangible resources to fulfill the law of the Old Testament, the law of Moses. Okay? We're talking about the works that reflect your faith, which summons the grace of God. It activates the grace of God. So when he says in Philippians 2 verse 12, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Verse 13, for it is God who works in you both the will and to do for his good pleasure. So the, the works that we do, we don't take credit for. That's all that's saying. But still, the works that you do to activate the grace of God, he honors that as a reflection of your faith. Okay, that's why he says in Matthew chapter 3, verse 8, produce works worthy of repentance. Meaning you don't just repent out of your mouth but again, that godly sorrow, there has to be, that's why it's important to have a relationship with Christ to where you're confessing your sins. If you're doing it daily, even things that you may consider minute, that you're unaware that God looks at as a big thing, or even if it's a small thing to him, just, just you having the wherewithal to repent. That's what he looks at. That's what activates his grace. We're talking about activating the grace of God. We already know you can't fulfill the law. Okay. Titus chapter three, verse eight says, those who believe in God are careful to maintain good works. Careful means cautious. Again, that we're talking about the fear and trembling. Fear, trembling, being careful, all of these things are, the, again, tightrope, the narrow gate language type walk with Christ. They do, to, to say that all of your sins, past and future, are forgiven, the Bible don't say that. The Bible does not say that. There are laws that are cushioned in between. Your, your sins that you may commit in the future being covered by the blood of Jesus. He's done his work on the cross. Now you have to do your part, okay? Not that you take credit for your part, but again, this godly sorrow, being careful with fear and trembling. This, this is all the, see, the Bible, the scriptures are cryptic, all right? These are the survival scrolls, 
all right? But the scriptures are cryptic. You can't pick and choose scriptures and they're just twisting it as hard as you can so that you can feel good about your rebuttal. That's, that's deception, and there's a demon behind that. I haven't even got into deliverance. Deliverance is a whole, now I'm going to really be hitting deliverance hard the remainder of this year because I need to pump some more messages into the deliverance gate. Again, we're talking about salvation, deliverance, revelation. There is a narrow gate that you will enter into by the grace of God when this meat suit hits the dirt. Okay, this is all a shell that you're living in. It's, in, in my opinion, it's your greatest enemy amongst the three enemies, the world, the devil, and the flesh. Okay, James 2, verse 14 through 20 talks about what profits a man that says he hath faith and no works. Can faith save him? Faith without works is dead. There you go. That kill that kills once saved, always saved. If you have faith in Christ and you believe in your heart, the, the matter of fact, it's, uh, 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 I mentioned the scripture earlier that said that's even worse. It's even worse to know the commandments, to believe in your heart, and to still do otherwise. Okay? Faith without works is dead. Faith can't save you. Grace alone can't save you. If a person has never received Christ and believed in their heart that he's their Lord and Savior, that doesn't activate the grace of God. They may receive common grace. I've done a teaching on common grace versus saving grace. Common grace is available to everyone who has breath in his nostrils on the earth, okay? There's a difference between common grace and saving grace. Many of these prosperity preachers are starting to use common grace to draw big crowds. And they're using their tangible things to show that God is with them. But they either they do understand, but they have that spirit, that stronghold that's deceiving them into continuing in that doctrine of using tangible resources and things that God may have blessed him with because God honors his word, okay? Even the wicked man has received some common grace from God, all right? But when you're talking about saving grace, there's a narrow gate, all right? There's a narrow gate. Most people are going to the lake of fire, all right? I've said that in videos before. And it's, it's, it's scary to me. It's the scariest verse in the Bible I've ever read. And it makes me look internally. I'm not sitting here on the outside looking in, just pointing. No, I'm checking myself as well. You know, I'm, I'm trying to die daily, as Paul talks about. The flesh will never if there was one saved, always saved, even the Apostle Paul, the flesh will never get him to say, well, I die daily. But that's not even in the flesh. Paul even said, he said, even with him, there, there's, there's a war in his members that's warring against his spirit that when he would try to do good, evil was always present. OK, and, and you give a lot of guys, like I said, they stand firm on one saved, always safe because of pride. It's about winning an argument and they get real fancy with their words and with their phrases and with their rebuttals and their opening arguments. And they're focused on that versus focusing on the truth. And I want to mention this before I close. OK, I've talked about in previous videos, you can go on my website and check it out, talking about God's death sentence and how there is a curse against every individual race of people in particular. 
I talked about my own people, how we have a curse within our people of division. And the scripture even talks about uh, in, in uh, Deuteronomy 28, the curses that would come upon the Hebrew man, the so-called black man, where he would scatter us amongst the nations. There is only one type of people that are scattered amongst the nations. Okay, and that's caused divisions between if Jamaicans come around so-called black American people or Jamaicans uh, come around Nigerians, there's always a competition with one another to show the white man who's better or to show off uh, types of fashion or cars or education. That, that's a curse of division. There's pride that comes along with that. But the Most High cursed our people because we were supposed to be the people who taught the Gentiles. But the curse against the Gentiles, all the other races, is a curse of comfort, a curse of deception. And I have to, I have to say this. A lot of your theologians have made big business off of teaching false doctrine in these seminary schools. Okay, they've been teaching, they haven't been teaching the truth about who the true people are. You may say, well, is that a big deal? Yes, it is a big deal. Because now you're breaking down the different challenges that different ethnicities, different people from different backgrounds and walks of life, the different challenges that they have to conquer so that they can come into the faith, okay? Because the Bible is all about race. If you don't think the scriptures is all about race, you look at the, it's Hebrew men, okay, of the tribes of Judah, their names are written on the, the, the walls, the four corners of the walls of, Jeru, uh, the, of New Jerusalem, okay? And on the gates are the 12 Hebrew apostles, their names are written on the gates. Those are, that's, that's all one race of people. Okay, and of course, Christ himself came from the lineage of Judah. He also mentioned in the book of Revelation that there are those who say they are Jews and are not. Okay, this is all race. And it's nothing, it's nothing for our people to get proud about because Pride uh, is what got us cursed. Our people got comfortable. A lot of our people were kings of Judah and Israel. And, and when Christ was crucified, our people had a lot to do with that. And it was our people who said, let, our, let his blood come upon us. Okay, so there are generational curses. Once you go into who the peoples are, now you get to go into where the demons are hiding at with the different generational curses. Okay, that that's deep teaching. The scripture talks about the deep things of God. It's not a two dimensional thinking. A lot of a lot of theologians need deliverance from that two dimensional thinking. Or well, is Christ one person or two persons? Or well. Uh, that's works salvation, and they just stick to the same scriptures and don't go into the deep things, the mysteries of the scriptures, because they're cryptic. You have to break, break the code through scriptures and through the revelation of the Holy Spirit, okay? It, it, it takes studying on what, of course, what must you do to be saved. All right, but we have to look at it from all aspects. The four pillars of our salvation is faith, grace, works, and repentance. You can't go wrong with that. We repent because we're humbling ourselves before God. That the fasting is a great way to atone for your sins. But if you believe that you're once saved, always saved, the flesh is too strong that you're never going to fast. And if you don't humble yourself before God, he said he resists the proud. OK, if you never humble yourself before God, you never repent. 
you're saying that the work that Christ did on the cross, that there is no anguish, there is no pain that you feel for the way they treated him when he came in the days of his flesh. But the, 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 you're saying that that doesn't mean anything to you. People who believe in once saved, always saved, try to flip it and say that, well, people who are, are talking work salvation are saying that that wasn't enough. That's a lie from the pit of hell. No, we're saying that, yes, the work that Christ did on the cross, we honor that. And because we honor that, we, we repent, Lord, because we know that it was people in our bloodline. The God judges man as one whole bloodline. That's why as the scripture says, through Adam, sin came into the earth. Okay? Because sin came into the earth through Adam, now we have to deal with the iniquities of Adam. Yes, Christ came to redeem man, but he came to redeem man on the, on the conditions. That's why he gave us the keys to the kingdom, that whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. He gave us the gift of repentance. Okay, he sent the comforter, the Holy Spirit, to, to be, be a warning to us, to warn us of our sins so that the Holy Spirit will live in us to keep us from sinning. So you're going to say we're once saved, always saved, that Christ did all of those things. And now you're trampling on his grace by saying all of that is works. No, we are not accounting for our works as justification or even sanctification. We're, we're saying we believe that Christ died on the cross for our sins. And Christ, now the ball is in his court, saying, okay, now I see your faith. Repent, like he told the woman, go thy way and sin no more. Again, one of the first things he said was repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's all I have. And I hope and I pray that those who believe in this once saved, always saved doctrine from the pits of hell will do away with that doctrine and practice righteousness, practice humbling yourself before Christ. I pray that in Jesus' name. Hey, you guys, check out my website. Also, like the video, share it, and click on the notification bell. A lot of my material, I'm moving to the website because of the censorship of YouTube. But you guys let me know what you think in the comment section and enjoy the rest of your day.